Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming here this morning. On behalf of Kure Company, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to this uh, very early morning lecture in Paris. And uh, it's a great pleasure being here. And today we would like to introduce you to uh, Kure's uh, specialty products, uh, high performance polymers that provide performance you may need. And at uh, the two people here on stage for you this morning, that's my colleague, Dr. Amir Bahami, to my left. He's a market development and technical expert for the polyamide p t And my name is uh, Dr. Robert Firth, and I'm the head of new business development at Kure here in Europe. I'd like to give you a very quick rundown about the agenda about our presentation this morning. Uh, we will like to introduce our innovation process from Kure to you after I had said a few words about the Kure company and its, uh, and its business in general. Um, the main part of the lecture, of course, this morning will be technical. It will be about Genestar PA9T, our high-performance polyamide. Dr. Bahami will talk about some of the properties, of course, and as you can see, uh, next to product features, we will, comp uh, we will uh, talk about composites. That's why it's uh, highlighted here. That's going to be the major part of the talk. But besides that, I would like to take this opportunity to also briefly mention some of our very interesting fiber products and show you one nice example about a vibration damping mesh film, which has also remarkable application possibilities. For those of you who don't know Kure Company, it's founded in 1926 in the western city, western Japanese city of Kurashiki. Totally, we have up today 11,200 plus uh, employees. We have uh, a networking capital of uh, 515 billion yen. That's roughly 4.5 billion US. And uh, out of that money, we spend some 4% annually on R&D. So that shows that R&D is a vital part of the company and is also very much included in its DNA. As for Kure Company, we are a company where we say we have a global presence. So as you can see, we are present in 28 countries globally, and we have some 52 plus production and business sites. We are producing on all three, on the major three continents in, in the Americas. We produce in Asia, of course, and also here in Europe. Our chemistry of Kure Company is very much based on three or four pillars, to be more precise. Vinyl acetate chemistry is a major uh, pillar of our chemistry and all the derivatives derived from that type of chemistry. Isoprene chemicals, it's yet another big chunk of our business and there we also cover the synthesis from the monomer up to the polymers and cover their applications. As a company was founded, as I said, in 1926, it was founded as a fiber company, a textile company, and that's why we are still having today a big fiber and textile business. However, we are out of fashion. We are now into more technical textiles. So for example, into geotextiles. If you like to support a hill or a mountain and you need strong ropes and things like that, that's exactly where Kure will be found. Next to that, we have another business unit which is on functional polymers and functional materials. And this includes even dental products. So among the big players in the dental field, Kure is one of them delivering glues for teas, but also ceramics for permanent restoration. Main applications for our products are in architectural and construction as interlayer films. We are in healthcare and pharmaceuticals. You found our products in automotive industry. There is plastics, there is clothing, and we have paper and packaging as one of our applications next to printing inks. 
Also in the solar industry, you will find our products and in electronics. Last but not least, sports equipment and toys are covered and also paints and coatings. Last but not least, environmental protection is a big area for us as well because um, we have water purification systems based on activated carbon. I would like to take the opportunity here this morning to also introduce you to Kure's innovation because innovation is a key milestone for the company and uh, we have newly developed as of uh, January this year what we call the Innovation Networking Center. This institution is more uh, virtual rather than a building uh, organization, but it has a great uh, importance to the company. We want to create innovations via organic collaborations with inside and outside from the QRA group and solve social issues. And uh, it's very important for us that we bring customer needs and market development close to our R&D people. So we're having the customers and the, com uh, the partner companies on one side, and on the other side, of course, we have the internal leadership of the company. And the missing link between the outside world and the Kura inside world will be now filled by what we call the new innovation networking center. And the main task of this group of people, we are roughly now 100 in, in, uh, in the global perspective, uh, this innovation networking center will cover the communication internally between R&D, marketing, and other internal functions on one side, and on the other side, the outside, the customer, the potential customers, and partner companies we are working with. Bringing their needs together is the key task for the innovation networking center, and we will work gross cross-organizational and globally in networking. This is something I want to highlight because in Kure Company, it's a traditional business with very separate business areas and units, and we will bridge this. We will tear down internal silos and have a wide communication throughout all ranks, throughout all regions, throughout all businesses. And of course, we take full advantage of our in-house capacities and capabilities. There's a lot of know-how in the company which we want to leverage for these new applications and uh, um, solutions to unmet customer needs. Of course, digitalization is a major part of that journey on which we are because we have to digitalize our whole processes and including R&D far more than before. And last but not least, we want to have faster decision-making in order really to keep up with pace. Very briefly, how it will work, we will identify the areas where to play. That's the outside look coming into the company. And as you can see, the error on the bottom shows the exploration, the ideation, the incubation, the lab and pilot, and the launch uh, steps, which we will follow. And as we go from catching the ideas using open innovation and other uh, methods, we will then bring this into the company, decide exactly where we want to play and how we want to play, and then we want to play and play brings uh, basically um, the products and the solutions to the customers. And we hope to do so in a very speedy manner because as you know, time to market is and was always a key. So after I've told you a lot about the company and how we are organized and what our plans are for the next, uh, what we call midterm plan, the next five years, it's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Amir Bahami to you. He will talk to you about PA90, the Genestar polyamide product from Kure. Aman uh, Bahami, your floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fuss. Thank you, everyone, for your presence today. Uh, happy to be here with you. So as uh, Dr. Fuss mentioned, I will explain you about our Genestar PA90 portfolio and its uh, potential applications in composites. So first of all, what is PA90? So PA90 is a PPA, or polyephthalamide, or as it's also called, an aromatic polyamide. As you see the structure here, it's composed of a long diamine chain with nine carbon atoms and a terephthalic acid group where it gets the name PA90. So PA90 has a relatively high TG, glass transition temperature of 125 degrees, and it comes in two types, extrusion resins with a melting temperature of 264 and injection resins with a melting temperature of 300 degrees C. So this unique uh, chemical structure of PA90 gives it a series of features that could be mainly summarized as having the lowest water absorption among high heat resistant polyamides 
And this low water resistance, uh, low water absorption, sorry, gives it a very good dimensional stability. And when combined with the high TG, it gives it a very good performance in hot, wet conditions. In addition, PA90 has very good chemical resistance and also a good laser transmittance. So if your application requires laser welding, uh, PA90 would offer a good laser transmittance for that. So let's have a look quickly at its mechanical properties at high temperature. So you see here the storage modulus uh, as a function of temperature in dry condition. The red curve is PA90, and you see that the drop in mechanical properties comes quite later after typical competitors like PA66, PA46, which is mainly due to high TG. However, if we look at the same mechanical properties after water absorption in hot water at 85 degrees C, we see that the difference becomes even more uh, clear, and so the lighter red curve is again PA90, and you see that the drop in mechanical properties uh, comes much later than competitor grade. Here, the main reason is the low water absorption, because as you know, water absorption reduces the TG and also chemically degrades slightly the resin, so if you have low water absorption, you will also have good uh, uh, mechanical properties after conditioning. Likewise, mechanical properties after heat aging. You see here heat aging up to 5,000 hours at three different temperatures for a non-reinforced PA90. And you see that even at relatively high temperature, 150, uh, the retention of mechanical properties is still quite good, which means that PA90 offers very good mechanical properties at high temperature and also long-term heat resistance upon heat aging. So we spoke about low water absorption. Here you see the water absorption as a function of time after 15 days. And we indeed see that PA90 absorbs much less water than other polyamide or polyephthalamides. It's typically less than 2% of water absorption, 1.8 typically, which itself gives a very good dimensional stability. As you see here, the blue bars are dimensional change of PA90 in both malt direction and transverse direction. So this was the features of PA90 resin itself. What about its performance as a composite? You see here the flexural properties for two different glass fiber organo sheets based on two different uh, type of e-glass, commercial e-glasses from the market. The green bars are PA90 based organo sheet and the black bars on the right are the market reference. And we see that the flexural strength is visibly improved compared to the market reference. Likewise, the flexural stiffness also is improved regardless of the type of glass fiber uh, that you use. Now we saw very briefly the features of the resin itself and how it behaves for example, as a glass fiber organo sheet. The question is, what would be the potential applications of PA90 in composites? So you could guess with this profile of properties, low water absorption, high heat resistance, good dimensional stability, you could define applications in automotive and aerospace like roof cross member, bumper beam that need good uh, stiffness, or rotor blades or wings and flaps that need very good dimensional stability and low sensitivity to humidity. Or for example, you could use PA19 composites used for uh, battery casing because as you know very well, in a battery casing you need a high stiffness to be resistance against torsion and bending. Good uh, mechanical properties, especially at high temperature and also low water absorption. And finally, the last candidate application could be a pressure vessel where you need very good tensile strengths, flame retardancy, high chemical resistance. And finally, a good point that, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, PA90 comes in extrudable and injectable resins. So potentially you can have the liner made from PA90 and also the composite shell again from a 
composite with the matrix of PA90, which would help you uh, in the aspects of uh, recyclability and sustainability. So this was very briefly, very quickly, in a nutshell, what PA90 is and how it can be used in composite markets. So with this, we will transit to the next section where uh, Dr. Fuss will explain you some other solutions offered by Kurarai. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Bahami. Uh, and I would like now to take this story a little further and to telling you about other applications of uh, polymer where Kure, as, a, as I said, a former textile company, has uh, great knowledge in, in fiber. Um, here I have listed for you some Kure available fibers according to their melting point. And you can see we're starting with products in the range of 200 degrees C. Uh, phenoxy fibers, giving it 50 degrees C more. You can go to the polycarbonate fibers. Going even higher, we reach what uh, Amir discussed already in detail for the use in uh, uh, composite applications, the polyamide uh, 9T fiber having a melting point of uh, 300 degrees C. And even if you need to go higher in uh, melting temperatures, we have a product, the polyetheremite uh, PI fiber, uh, at your availability. Just a few brief examples on what you can do with all the various types of fibers we have, and I listed here for you uh, three examples. The top one you can see, it's chopped fiber uh, plus chopped carbon fiber, and in a wet laying process similar to paper making, you can make uh, a paper-like product where the carbon fiber, the chopped carbon fibers, and the uh, uh, chopped um, artificial fibers um, can be processed, and these products you can even um, emboss to give a three-dimensional shape. In the second row, you can see non-woven materials, again, together with uh, a carbon fiber textile, and then using the, the standard processes and heat and pressure, you are able to produce uh, organo sheets. Last but not least, the bottom example uh, gives you the fibers uh, carbon fibers and, for example, PI fibers, you co and intermingle them, and within a few steps, you can get uh, these uh, co mingled type products where we have an example here in form of a hose. Yet another product which I would like to draw your attention to this morning uh, concerns vibration damping mesh film. So vibration damping is a very important uh, feature if you can control that, especially, for example, in uh, goods like sports uh, or, or other uh, p uh, products in use, where especially you have contact uh, with the human body. The product here we are talking about is a mesh sheet made from thermoplastic styrene elastomer. And uh, the features of this product are it's uh, having elasticity like rubber, but it does not hydrolyze. So that's very important that the stability is given. It's uh, having a light specific uh, density. So we're talking about 0.9 to 1 uh, of the density. It's uh, also exhibiting a great cold resistance. So minus 40 Celsius is still a good temperature for this material to work with. And in addition, it has excellent uh, elongation um, recovery. As such, we have designed, our colleagues have designed two different products, one uh, with different uh, characteristics, of course. Uh, one is uh, the vibration damping product, so it has a very low uh, repulsion, and uh, a rubber-like product, which has a high elastic uh, performance, as you can see with this drop test. If you want to see this dropping test onto the different materials, uh, please do come to our booth in K40 in Hall 6, so in this hall here, and we can live demonstrate the very remarkable performance of these products to you. As we are scientists, of course, we always like to see some figures and some numbers. And here I have given, I'm giving you an example on the combination of the mesh film with carbon fiber reinforced plastics. And there we're having a stacking of 10 ply carbon fiber reinforced plastics with one single layer, with one single ply of the mesh film. And we can demonstrate the improved vibration damping performance as we will see it here on the graphs on this slide. So what you see there is a frequency versus the loss factor uh, which has been shown, and it's a logarithmic scale, 
I'm thinking you can't see the fine resolution of the, um, of, the, uh, of the grid there. But the bottom line is that the bottom line in this, uh, transparent, in this um, uh, diagram is showing the material 10-ply carbon fiber reinforced plastic without the mesh. And um, if you see then the top line, and again, it's a logarithmic scale, please notice, uh, you see the improvement, how well the damping is done by just adding one ply of the mesh film. So you can see even in numbering figures, it's a remarkable difference, and you can feel the effect, of course, notably. So major applications, as I mentioned before, it's a snowboard or it's a tennis racket, and uh, other sports goods, for example, um, are targeted. With that, I would like to conclude our presentation here this morning. Thank you very much for your uh, time to be here. But of course, as usual, if there are questions, uh, Dr. Bahami and myself are happy to take them. Thank you very much. A good pre um, this is a good presentation. Um, your fiber um, PA9 T um, can I assume that is a uh, tow um, in the tow format, just like uh, the carbon fiber, glass fiber, that kind of a format, tow? Uh, can you understand the question? Yeah, it's, 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 uh, yeah, we have it on tow form, but also in filament forms, of course, multi-filament and single filament. Yes. If that, yeah. Um, if that is the case, um, how do you comp would you compare the spreadability against the other type of fiber like carbon or glass? Is that easy to spread or it is not easy or is that similar like the other type of fibers? Um, as I'm not the fiber expert guy, I have my colleague here with us at the booth and I would be happy to invite you to come to our booth and then you can talk directly to our fiber expert because I don't want to say anything wrong here today. Is that okay? Uh, thank you. Sorry for that answer. Thank you. Yeah. And the other question is sure. the, about the mechanical property. Uh, you showed the uh, flexural strength, flexural stiffness. Um, is there any comparison of the shear, shear stress? So, uh, well, the data is not presented here, but yes, uh, those tests have, uh, have been also done. But uh, as Robert mentioned, I think it's easier if you just kindly pass by the booth and we can discuss and show more properties. Thank you. No problem, pleasure. Um, hello, I have two questions uh, from the live. Yes, so please. the first one, they say, is there any collaboration between the Korea's Innovation Center and the Turkish R&D uh, skate holders? And the second one, they say, uh, what is the collaboration model for the Innovation Center? So the one uh, about the mm, uh, relation between Innovation Networking Center and R&D. Okay. And what was the second question, please? So we don't have a very loud voice here, so it's very... Uh, what is the collaboration model for the Innovation Center? Okay, the collaboration model for the Innovation Center is that we set up teams depending on applications. So that means uh, if there is a market interest of a certain unmet need, we directly talk to the people in R&D and express the, the need, and they do um, the research work and the development work for, um, for the marketing people, and we do that directly in, uh, in groups which we call um, the, the market groups or the, the, the market segment groups. Thank you. And the second question was, if you like to repeat and just talk into the mic, then I can hear it. Um, well, uh, you answered that, I think, the second. So the first okay. one is, is there any collaboration between the Korea's Innovation Center and Turkish R&D skate holder? Turkish R&D? Yeah. R&D, research and development. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I saw that what I answered already. Yeah, there's this direct link that our R&D, which is located in Japan. So most of the, uh, let's say, basic type of research is done in Japan. We have some regional ones, but the ones in Japan are done in uh, Tsukuba City, which is sort of the Silicon Valley uh, of, of Japan. And there we have the research center. We directly talk to these people, yeah. Ooh, OK, thank you. Thank you. 
So thank you very much. I think the time is now over. And uh, if you have any questions further, please do see us here in Hall 6 in uh, K40 uh, is our booth. And you're very welcome uh, to stop by. Thanks for your time. And enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. <laughs>